To discuss this conflict, I'm joined in the studio by Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Chief Audwogwe. Thank you, sir, for coming on the program. I'm also joined by the Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of operations, Mr. Taiwo Lakunasta. Sir, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Ms. E.A. Jonathan is the CEO of CESO, an NGO that has been providing relief to victims of conflicts across Nigeria in Borno, but more recently in Benue State. Thank you, ma'am, for Thank coming you. to join us. And our last panelist is Dr. Saleh Momole. He's an academic who is also a member of the Kaduna State Peace Commission. Thank you for being part of this program. Thank you very much. Now, if I could start with you, um, Honorable Minister. We, we heard in that video that we saw communities that said, by and large, there was a degree of peace. Um, in the past between them and little conflicts tended to be resolved using traditional um, conflict uh, resolution mechanisms. We've seen an escalation. What in your view is responsible? Um, first, thank you for inviting us here. I think that um, there are causes which um, are beyond the control of any one of us here. Climate change, for instance. Um, once the dry season sets in, cattle begin to move southwards from uh, the drier parts of Nigeria and even the surrounding West African countries in search of fodder and water. It's not unlikely that the numbers of herds are increasing by the year. Um, cows come in from Niger, Chad, sometimes as far away as uh, uh, Mauritania in search of grass in the Benue Valley, uh, stretching from Adamawa through Taraba uh, uh, and Benue uh, before the uh, River, Niger, River Benue joins the River Niger. These areas have water and a reasonable amount of green fodder for cattle to eat. And for the herdsman, water and grass are the key components in his management of cattle. Now, in, at Independence, there were about 56 million Nigerians. Today, we're close to 200. The cattle route that existed in the First Republic are now blocked. This town in which we are today called Abuja. Abuja was literally a highway for cattle trans traffic between the northwest and the southeast. Today Abuja is a city, so the route is blocked. So cattle have to pass through, and then now they have to go into areas which ordinarily they wouldn't enter, which were farms and so on. And as they move on, sometimes in large numbers, there could be sometimes up to 1,000 or 2,000 cows in a head. Okay. If I may interrupt, you, you, you talk about this almost as if these are things that we did not predict and we didn't know were going to happen, and almost as if cattle run on their own without people, if you see, guiding them. And yet we know that it is people that own cattle. It is people who decide how to migrate from one place to the other. And um, government you would have thought, and ordinary Nigerians would know that these issues are coming up. I mean, climate change has been predicted for a very long time. So um, I'm still trying to understand why you see this as an issue. Uh, it's an issue because as far back as the First Republic, we had what they called grazing reserves in northern Nigeria mainly. There were also ranches even in the southwest, southeast, uh, what was eastern Nigeria. 415 grazing reserves were created by the First Republic management of then northern Nigeria. Some of them were as large as 28,000 football fields in one state. Somebody was thinking ahead. Then the coup of 66 came and slowly nobody cared for these grazing reserves anymore. The water systems went under, there was overgrazing, and slowly as populations grew, people encroached on these reserves. And so the cattle, there is no way a herdsman will stay in one spot if he can find water and grass for his cattle. Now, successive regimes have talked about it. And we even, about two years ago, when I came into the ministry, I wrote to all the state governors saying, we face danger and this crisis can only get worse if we do nothing. Can we have some land in your state where we create large reserves of ranches to keep these cattle and give them the grass, the water, the medication they need, and harvest the milk, and so on? Some replied positively, some said no. Okay, so, so we now have issues of climate change and growing population. We have issues of policies that were not sustained. Okay. What else? 
Uh, a, a bit of, uh, shall I say, carelessness on the part of, of governance that when the rains come, this crisis diminishes. It's in the dry season, it intensifies. And during the rains, it's time when we should prepare for when the crisis will come. We just have to reform the way we manage livestock production here. Yeah, are you satisfied that these are the reasons for the conflict that we're seeing increasingly between farmers and herdsmen? I think they, are, they could be underlying factors, but I think the key thing is careless, carelessness on the part of the government, with all due respect, is an understatement. People have died on both sides. We've watched the report, we've seen the allegations. We've tracked, at least in, since April 2013, we've tracked over 60 attacks in Benue. They have a certain predictability and people die in large numbers. So there's a warning mechanism in place? Or so is there's it a that pattern. People, there's a pattern, right? There's a pattern. So we know that these headsmen come, they come in large numbers, drive people off the land. Of course, if they come attacking, you've seen people run away. And then they sit there for some time and they graze. People have died. There's impunity. If they're moving in large numbers, we've been having reports about these things as far back as 2013. Even in 2014, there were suspected cases of use of chemical weapons in at least one community. Now, if it's investigations sort of started and then they stalled. So on our part, yes, there are underlying factors, climate change. This is something the government that we have, we've had a democratically elected government since 1999. So there's long-term planning that we hope goes on. What we see come is we see politicians come and go, but we also see those who form the civil service and who do the work, the administrative work. So there's the planning that should go into it. There's also the, the law enforcement that needs to happen. If people are moving in large numbers, I mean, we know these things. There's enough technology around right now. We've got drones, we've got everything. We know this happens. The re those things have been reported severally to okay. the police and all of that. Now, so I'd, I'd, I'd those like should us be to, able to. Yeah, because, you know, you know in, in, we, we have situations where we, we get a lot of reports, this has happened and that has happened. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the failure, and we'll discuss this a little bit later, sometimes of the media, is to interrogate some of the information that they are fed.